explain to people for us um, how you came to have a relationship with George Balanchine? Oh, <laughs> well, this goes. Um, I was a tap. Did you know that I was a tap dancer before I was a ballet dancer? Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I started studying in Springfield, Massachusetts when I was about five years old. And, you know, because Shirley, uh, of course, at that time, Shirley Temple was all the rage in the movies. And I wanted to be like Shirley Temple. And she took, she was a tapper. So that's what I wanted to do. And I was very good at it. And uh, my teacher gave me a scholarship. And then my family moved away to New York. and they knew nothing about dance at all. I mean, they were just a very low middle class family, but loving to me and wanting to help me. So I told my mom I wanted to dance. And she said, well, okay, she took me to the YWCA. And I don't know what you would call it, but it just was, it just was a little bit of tap, a little bit of jumping around. They, I, I, that's what I did, and I loved it. And then we moved to Los Angeles, and my dad had a cousin there, a woman, and she saw how much I loved dancing, and she said, would you come with me to the theater? There's a musical going on that I'd like you to take you to. So I went, and uh, guess what it was? George Balanchine's Song of Norway. Mm -hmm. So that was, and I said to my cousin, oh, that's the kind of dancing I want to do. And she said, well, that's called ballet. So I went home and I looked up in the yellow pages to see the most Russian name I could find, which was Madame Nizhinska. And that's how I got started with Madame Nizhinska. And uh, so all... Uh, from my very first start of ballet, I was influenced by Mr. B's line. And then I had so little training and I began teaching pretty soon. Uh, what I would look at pictures and every time I saw a picture I liked, it was one of Mr. Balanchi's dancers. So what I developed was the eye for his line and without ever having studied with him or anything, I was able to impart that to the students. And that, so that when they went to SAB, Stanley Williams said to Nancy, do you remember Nancy? Nancy Graves. Anyway, she might have been before your time. No. He said, were you trained here at SAB? That's, that's how much I, um, I understood his line, just some pictures and from my first experience of seeing it on the stage. And then uh, I had my school for a while and it was in Los Angeles and then we sold it and moved to the Valley where I was on Mason Avenue where you girls started. And Mr. Balanchine's company had come to the Greek theater and they were doing Midsummer Night's Dream. And I sent, at, this was my new school now in the San Fernando Valley, so everybody was pretty new. And I sent my dancers down, and they took about five of them. And uh, I was very excited. And of course, then the next year they came back with the same ballet, and Janet Reed was a ballet mistress again. And I sent my girls down, and she said to them, Who is your teacher? I've never seen students progress so much in one year so they told her and she called me up and she said uh would you like to have mr balanchine come out and see your school i would like him to see it i thought she was joking and i said oh of course and and that was the end of it and it was in august and our school closed the last two weeks of august and uh so the school closed and i never heard anything more then suddenly I got a phone call from her saying Mr. Balanchine would be there. That I think it was a Monday, but I'm not sure. Uh, 
and that he would like to watch me teach. So I had my secretary, Mrs. Lamers, call everybody, and I had three classes arranged, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. And the, I, I told the children that Mr. Balanchine might be arriving, but I, I wasn't sure he would come. And we started the class, the beginner's class, no Mr. Balanchine. We started the intermediate class, no Mr. Balanchine. And with, with a sinking heart, I started the third class. And one of the students yanked open the door and she yelled in, he's here. And sure enough, in walked Mr. Balanchine. And it turned out the reason he was so late that he drove himself, which everybody told me was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And in driving, and he got on the 405 and he went to Long Beach instead oh. of to Fernando Valley. Oh. But you know, he was so determined to see me that he turned around and drove all the way back to Chatsworth <laughs> and came. And he said, I came because I didn't believe that you were a good teacher. I thought you were a fraud. So he watched me teach with, and you can imagine how nervous my hero was there to watch me work. And I, I started the whole class over from the beginning. He watched the entire class. And at the end, he asked me to come over and he said, I like your work very, very much, but you know, I can't use you. And I, I didn't realize that he'd been auditioning me. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I can't use you because you don't have a good instep. You don't have feet. He said, but I like your work very much. And I'm inviting you to the School of American Ballet for my workshops. And uh, so I said, thank you very much. And I didn't believe that. I mean, I just couldn't believe that this man would be interested in what I was doing. Sure enough, about a week later, um, I guess it was Madame Arusoff called me and said Mr. Balanchine was inviting me to his workshop. And that's how I started. And he always recognized me. He, he, he said to Madame Arusoff, I want the whole school to be open to her. She can see whatever she wants to see. She can come to company class. We're at her disposal. And Eleanor and I took advantage. Every year we went for two weeks. And I learned so much. Do you know when I went there for the first time, I never knew what coup de pied was. Madame Mijinska never taught that step, that motion of the foot. And you know, you can't do much without coup de pied. <laughs> uh, and I remember I used to be so afraid dancers would roll and hurt their bodies that I made everybody stand in third position. So when I went to the first workshop with Mr. B, he said, no, absolutely no third position. Put them in fifth. They're going to roll in third just as much as they roll in fifth. But in fifth, they'll begin to strengthen their body and their turnout. So I came home and the first class, they were all standing dutifully in third position. And I said, what are you doing? Everybody fifth position. And then we began implementing what I had learned from Mr. B. Mm -hmm. And it's a relationship that stays even to this day. I love him. I respect and admire him very much. Can you share about how he taught you to how to hold the hand and to yes. see the inside of the wrist? That first day, yes, that first day when he came to my school. So he said, let me show you a few things. And the things I remember most is he showed me how to hold the hand. You have to round your palm. You don't have a flat palm. And the fingers, uh, when you look down your fingers, the index finger should be between the ring finger and the middle finger and the little pinky sticks out a little bit but the index finger does not stick up and neither does the thumb the thumb is rounded and it looks as though it's going to touch the middle finger but it doesn't 
And then when you do elongé, then you open out your fingers and your wrist, and then down it comes. Mm -hmm. And what about when you're holding your arm in second? I remember you telling me to see the inside crease of the wrist and the inside of the palm. Oh, uh, what I explained to the dancers and what he explained to me is that it's a slight slope from your shoulder down and everything faces towards the audience, the wrist, the inside of the elbow, the palm. It all faces the audience and the elbow is lifted and this this upper part of the arm can you see that it is always held up it's never drooped down so it's up the elbow's turning back and your arm is rounded in front of you mm -hmm.